Um, today we welcome Chef Brendan Edwards of Detroit's Corktown Hotspot Gold Cash Gold. Has anyone been? Show of hands. Woo! Ooh, most of us. All right, well, let's get the other hands up after this. <laughs> Um, prior to Gold Cash Gold, uh, Chef Edwards created the original menu at Ultra Hip Standby. Hands? Anyone? No? A few? Okay. Uh, when it opened in 2015 and spent time at the Who's Who of Detroit's restaurants, Forest Grill, Rose, Katoy, and Piedem. Uh, his progressive American style combines experience working in Michelin starred restaurants in Chicago with his time abroad in Mexico and Japan, and we'll hear a little bit more about that throughout the conversation. So please welcome to Google Detroit, Chef Brendan Edwards. So yeah, um, I'm not used to normally talking in front of people. I think it's been <laughs> probably since high school, um, other than going to tables and kind of being in a more intimate setting. Um, but as, as I've been introduced, um, I'm a chef. I uh, cook on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm in a kitchen. Um, I've been doing it for about 18 years. Um, and um, I'm just going to keep my notes closer. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, mostly as, as uh, Jason mentioned, uh, I've, I've been in the Detroit area. I have kind of uh, been a little bit of a vagabond, moving my way in and out of the, the city as I kind of saw fit. Um, not, not to say that, you know, it wasn't uh, tight sometimes. You know, I saved up a bunch of money, moved to Japan, and then worked there uh, at a michelin star restaurant for three months, uh, pretty much straight. Uh, I worked from 7.30 in the morning till midnight, seven days a week. <laughs> um, so did things like that. Um, I also uh, spent some time in Mexico. I ended up living with a family that owned a restaurant, so therefore I kind of worked in a restaurant too. Um, and then I've spent a lot of time doing uh, what we call in our industry a stage. Uh, you guys would probably know it more as like an unpaid internship. And I've done that in restaurants uh, in LA and Chicago and a few other places, but um, it's kind of one of those things that ends up being kind of a fun and interesting perspective on how to approach dining. Um, all that being said, um, you know, I've worked a lot of long hours, uh, spent a lot of time not getting paid very much, <laughs> and a lot of other like fairly negative things that most people would kind of look at you and go, why why did you choose to do this? Uh, and a lot of people say, oh, it's probably your passion, you probably love to cook. Um, and that's kind of one of the more interesting things is that um, even though I work holidays, weekends, and I generally kind of cancel myself out of social events, I don't love to cook, which is probably the oddest thing that most chefs ever <laughs> would ever say. We haven't heard that yet out of all the chefs <laughs> yeah. yet, so that's, that's certainly a first so far. All right. <laughs> uh, so I've always been interested in cooking, though. I think it's like a very interesting uh, way to kind of interject yourself into people's lives without actually being a full-on part of it, uh, being in a like serious relationship or family or whatnot. Um, and I always thought of it as something interesting. Uh, going through culinary school, we took a food history class, and one of the quotes that kind of sat with me was that the onset of cooking was the onset of civilization. Um, that's what kind of birthed us all sitting around together, chatting and creating this like time around a warm fire with something cooking and, um, and nourished our brains more, we ended up evolving more. Um, and that's kind of where I really love is the fact that we all get together uh, and we are hosts and guests on a regular basis and in our homes, uh, in restaurants, and um, areas like this. Um, you guys are my host and I'm a guest trying to tell you about, I guess, my perspective on the world. Um, well, that's one of the big reasons too with Google. Uh, I know we didn't look at the cafe yet, but we, in all of our large Google offices, we have kind of these open collaborative cafe spaces and it's not just to give us free food, which is a very nice benefit, but it's more about kind of the social aspect, like, you know, let's, let's have meetings there, let's get together, let's host, interact, yeah. conversate around food, and food is kind of what brings us together, but that's not the key aspect of it necessarily. So it sounds very similar to kind of the philosophy we take here. Yeah, um, 
And I think that's what's kind of drawn me, um, I guess. Um, kind of wanted to tell you a little bit about my times and some of the fun experiences I've had being a host and a guest. Um, as I said, I, I went to Mexico. Uh, I was going to actually go to Culinary Institute of America in New York, uh, which is one of the finest uh, culinary schools in the U.S. And um, I went out and visited there in August of 2001. Uh, got to see the World Trade Centers right before 9-11, which was really interesting. Uh, immediately after accepting or getting my acceptance letter, I bought a plane ticket to live in Mexico. So um, I've always been kind of that person that always kind of did my own thing, despite my dad didn't really think that was a great idea. <laughs> uh, and, and that's where it kind of continued. Um, I thought that, you know, maybe this was a sign. This was something that I shouldn't be doing. I need to go find, find my own path. So I went down there and found a nonprofit agency that like ended up working at a Montessori school with preschool kids. It was great. Um, it probably helped me with my patients. I'm not a normal chef in the kitchen anymore, uh, the way you might see it on TV with like, Gordon Ramsay and all that jazz. Um, a lot of my cooks have kind of seen me as more of a Zen person. Like they, they don't see me lose my temper very often. Not to say that I haven't possibly thrown some things in my life, but uh, but it helped, and it was an interesting part of my path. Um, the the culture there, though, was interesting because I started to actually observe cultures and how I was received as a host, how I was uh, acting as a guest. Um, I got to travel a little bit and actually got to go into houses where they offered me things that uh, as an outsider, you're told, don't eat that, don't drink that. But it feels really odd to not. And because they're being so kind and mean like, we eat meat once every two months. So we slaughtered the pig for you. And we're serving it with lettuce. You're not supposed to eat lettuce. So um, obviously you eat less <laughs> uh, and get full a little quicker. But uh, it's an interesting perspective to have that as a guest, I'm trying to end up accommodating my host just as my host is probably even trying to accommodate me. Um, the more interesting point of view uh, was after I got back from Mexico, I ended up going, to, going through culinary school and I decided I, I loved hospitality. I loved serving people I loved, experiencing that moment of realizing that you're a part of someone's life, whether they know it or not. Um, like they probably don't know my name, but I've met many people that I've cooked for, but they don't even know that I cooked for them. They just said, hey, I went to Longman and Eagle and ate brunch and it was great. I was cooking that day. I know I was, because I was there almost every day. Um, but their perspective in saying like, oh, I had a great time, uh, kind of kept me going. So after I moved back from Japan, um, I went through culinary school and that was gonna be my passion. I was gonna commit, I was gonna do it. I was gonna become a really, really good cook. And then I was going to become the best host I could be. Um, and I uh, ended up going through culinary school. I worked for uh, Brian Polson, uh, Open Up Forest Grill, which is right around the corner from here. Um, I was the first uh, AM sous chef there. Um, I worked a lot. I loved it. Every time I saw a chef jot down a note, I took notes on his notes. And I went home and I researched so I could figure out how to make polenta because I'd never made polenta before. So I like wanted to know everything. And this is my way of like trying to be the best host I can. Uh, and I realized I started in looking back on my time and spending time with the culture of Mexico and the people there. I realized I was starting to become part of the culture here. But I was still more interested in making sure that I could see not only the culture here, but the culture elsewhere and how to actually pull that into our culture because as Americans, we've kind of adopted lots of cultures. And those cultures have become intrinsically us. Um, people from all over the world, we come here and bring our cuisines and our, our uh, well, we bring everything we are. And then we adapt it with all the people we're around. Italian food, if you go to Italy, isn't the same here as it is in Italy. 
Uh, I think if anyone has, has been to Italy, you'll realize that. Um, so I decided I'd go as far away from French cuisine and American everything I possibly could. So I thought about uh, how isolated Japan was. So I traveled to Japan. And I went there and studied every day uh, Japanese for uh, six months before I left. I did, well, I did five days a week. I did four hours a day. And I bought Rosetta Stone. I bought Japanese for Dummies, all those things, because I didn't want to seem like I was stupid the moment I walked in the door. Uh, that being said, I walked up to this uh, Michelin two-star restaurant. It's currently Michelin three-star. Uh, a place called Kichisen with Chef Yoshimi Tanigawa. And he came down befitting of what you can imagine Japanese men well, you can imagine J Japan. He came down wearing a monochromatic yellow jumpsuit at 8 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> peppy and ready to go. He's like a 50, I think it was like 56 or 57 at the time, and uh, had more energy than any person I can imagine at 8 o'clock in the morning, especially after I realized the hours that he was putting in. And immediately I had a translator there, but he started talking to me because he knew I was studying Japanese. And I could tell he was talking a little slower and things like that. Uh, I didn't understand a single word he said until he said, you understand that? I felt horrible. <laughs> I studied the wrong language. I don't know what happened. But my time with him was also really interesting because it was completely devoid of like a lot of the, the cultural norms that we have and the cultural norms that I studied of Western culture. Um, he does a style of cooking called kaiseki, uh, which is paired with uh, their uh, tea ceremony, which is, um, I got to study it with a bunch of like 40 year old women uh, that giggled like middle school girls the entire time, uh, every Wednesday for three hours. That being said, I got to sit on my knees for about two of those hours, and then they asked me to gracefully get up all the time. Um, that doesn't work, even in a 27 year old's body. Um, but I spent some time with him, and it was really amazing what he was as a host. Uh, he, I kind of call myself a gaijin pet because he would bring me everywhere he would go. He like loved having me there um, and wanted to kind of show me everything. I worked for free, that being said. Uh, I lived in a dormitory with your other apprentices uh, on a bunk bed. My top bunk was the kitchen. Uh, so it was like a rice cooker and like an induction burner. That was about it. Um, but he'd bring me everywhere he'd go. There's uh, one of my favorite times, which I didn't even understand what was happening, is he would tell me to go get dressed up. He, he'd tell me to put on a tuxedo, which I took as. I didn't bring a tuxedo, so I'm going to wear a button-up shirt and a belt and slacks and the nicest shoes I have. Um, and he did this every time we went out. And so he told me to go get dressed up in my tuxedo. And I ran across to the dormitory, came back, and he was dressed up. And he really loved, uh, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, the, the designer that has all the, the tattoo print on it. Christian? Arjay? No. Different one. Ed Hardy. Ed Hardy. Yeah. Christian is the, yeah, sorry. So Ed Hardy. He loved Ed Hardy. And he wore it all Ed Hardy. And we talked about it on that drive that I remember. He told me about how the hat he was wearing was Ed Hardy. And the, Shoes. What year was this? By the early 2000s? It was 2010. Oh, yeah. a little, little bit late for the Ed Hardy trend, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he had to tell, all the way down to his underwear, which he did point out that he was wearing Ed Hardy underwear. And we're driving through and we're talking about the little, little amount that we can talk. Uh, and then we stop and he pulls and gets into a parking spot. And uh, I have my Nintendo DS with me, and just in case I need to translate, there's a program on there that I could actually write like kanji or Japanese characters, and it would translate it into what I need to know. And, um, and as he's getting out, I open the door to get out, and he goes, no, 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 Joto mate. I go, all right, that means wait. And then I close the door, and I see him get out, and he goes into this place. I don't know what he's doing, but then I realize he's getting a haircut. I'm just waiting in the car. All right, that's fine. And he gets back in the car, and we continue our conversation, start driving around again. 
I thought maybe we were going to the market. Maybe he was going to show me something. Maybe he was going to take me out for lunch. I'm not sure. And then we just pull back up to the restaurant. And he says, go get dressed. Get ready for work. He took me on a car ride. I, I felt, I was like, I feel like a pet. This is amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we had lots of fun adventures like that. Um, he took me on a, on a run once just to go see something. I got to meet the Yakuza that came up to his door with like a, a Buddhist monk that drove the Yakuza around. Um, but he always kept me by his side because he always loved hosting me. And me as a guest, I tried my best to be a good guest. Of which turns into this story, which is on our run one day where he told me to get dressed up in a tuxedo. Uh, <laughs> And then he was in a, once again, a monochromatic jumpsuit. Uh, and we went on a run. It was like a four mile run. And I was running in dress shoes. <laughs> and as we're running, um, he stopped and he gave me a camera. And he says, run up there. Take a photo of me. I said, all right. So I, I ran up ahead of him a little bit. And he was an older man. He was jogging, you know. And I took a photo as he was running by me. And then he stops, and we look at the photo, and he says, wow, that's great. I go, all right, there you go. He says, take another one. That happened for all four miles. <laughs> uh, and the only way I could think of to be a good guest was to go with it. So I started pretending like this was a photo shoot in my head. I'm like, I can't be embarrassed. There's Japanese men in full-grown suits running so they can be early to a bus. Not on time, but early. That's amazing. Yeah. I can totally run down and lay on the ground and climb up trees <laughs> in you know, a button-up shirt just to make this guy happy, to make, make it like seem like I'm being a good guest. And I did that. And I laid down. And I, as he ran upstairs in, in like almost like a Rocky Bal Balboa fashion, <laughs> I took photos of him from trees, from the ground, and I, probably of around 150 photos over the course of four miles. And, uh, and when we got back, he was bragging to the translator. And he was like, oh, he's so, he's so genki, like energetic. Like, were you in the military? No, I, know, I was never in the military. I just had no idea what else to do because he kept asking me to take photos. So. Um, Sounds like you were maybe like on a hidden camera Japanese game show, in, in my opinion. I don't know. The, I want to check the internet. You might be out there somewhere. Uh, I'll put that in your guys' book. You are Google. I figure if anyone's we'll going to find some research it. After yeah. this. I think we can find some clips. Um, but anyway, that's, that's my initial impression of, of being a host and being a guest. And I came back to the US with a perspective on a few different cultures um, and how they react. And I think it's really interesting now that I have that perspective of um, I deal with hundreds of people a day coming in, sitting down, eating. Sometimes they don't like what they eat. So how do you do that? How do you compensate? How do you work with them as a host? Um, and my, my usual thing is I want to be as good of a host as I can. So I, I translate that and I say, if you don't like it, I'll get you something else. I won't charge you for that. I'll get you dessert. I will buy you a drink. Because if it was someone in your house, what would you do? And then also comes the duality of how are they a good guest? Um, at Gold Cash Gold, this is fairly telling, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Uh, I, had a, I had a group of like 20-year-old girls come in. There's 10 of them on a Friday night, 8 o'clock. And they all came in. They seemed like they were good guests. Everything was fine. They all ordered sandwiches, burgers and chicken sandwiches. Every single one of them got it and sent it back to the kitchen. I was like, oh, man, what's wrong? All of a sudden, I see all these servers coming back to the kitchen. This is a reverse flow. <laughs> I'm nervous at this moment. They did not like them. They just wanted them cut in half. All 10 of them. <laughs> now, on a Friday night, as a chef, I am a composed chef uh, most of the time. But in certain moments, it's hard to hold your composure. <laughs> I cut all of those sandwiches in half with a cleaver. Because I was like, I have more food coming out and more food coming this way. This feels not good. Um, and I think this is the question that I've started to kind of push upon myself. Uh, 
and diners and also see how America is actually relating to it in terms of how do we walk in and how do we be a guest? How do I be a better host? And I think America is kind of translating that and, and pushing it forward. Uh, we're creating our own identity. Um, cultures came in and changed uh, the way we work with food and they came in usually coming from a lesser into what America is, which is an abundance. And that's actually a really beautiful thing about America. Our quality started to diminish. If you look at Folgers and um, like the major coffee companies in World War II, they actually changed their beans from Arabica uh, to the lesser bean, which I can't remember the name of right now. But they changed their beans, and as you, if you actually check out their sales, their sales actually, by person, less people started drinking coffee because they started caring less about the quality of what they're doing. Um, and therefore their products suffered. That being said, they're still a major purveyor of coffee goods and all that jazz. You can still buy them in every store that you can find. But I don't want to deal with volume, I want to deal with quality. Because my thought is, is that I want to be a host. I want to be your, your person for the moment where you walk in and you feel good about the day that you came your first date, your second date, your anniversary, your meeting with friends, um, and that's what I do on a regular basis. And you can see that is, is changing with Selden Standard uh, that opened up in Detroit, which hopefully you've gone there, or Chartreuse, or Mabel Gray, or um, and numerous other chefs, Rose's Fine Foods. Um, they all kind of fit their own way of hosting, and they're all trying to do better. Um, in their communities and for you as guests when you go there. Um, and it's my kind of goal to keep pushing that. And I think also it's my goal to start teaching guests how to be guests too because I think that's an important part. Um, it's a relationship when you walk into a restaurant. Um, and it's not always an easy one. Often it's tumultuous. And um, and therein lies my, my general thoughts. Um, I stopped looking at my notes a while ago. <laughs> um, how are we looking on time? We're good. I was going to ask a question about that last point that you made um, <clears throat> in terms of expectations around hosts and guests, right? So I feel like Detroit is carving out kind of a unique ecosystem. Um, and you've worked a lot in Chicago as well, both typical standard Midwest American cities where you've kind of got the Midwest hospitality overall. Have you sp spent time on either coast, New York, Boston, uh, DC, or uh, West Coast, San Francisco, LA, and, and how does kind of the expectation of the guest host differ from kind of the core Midwest type ecosystem to one of the, one of the coasts where things are maybe a little bit more rigid, or on the East Coast, or maybe a little bit more laid back on the West Coast? Yeah. Um once again, like if you if you go to Europe, you'll see their styles of hospitality, um, their general food stuffs that they serve, all changes. And I think I see um, four distinct regions. There probably is a lot more, um, but you see the East Coast, the West Coast, the Midwest, and then the South. Um, my dad's actually from South Carolina, so I've spent time a decent amount of time uh, in the South. My sister lives in LA. So I got to actually work. Uh, I spent two months uh, out there, and then I just staged at restaurants. Um, so I was a babysitter to my niece for a while, which was really great. And then I would just occasionally relieve myself of them having to think about me because I thought I was, you know, a burden. So I'd just go and work at like Animal and whatnot, which are um, just like restaurants I really wanted to go to. And I think. Um, there's a lot more expectations on the East Coast, from uh, my understanding, from cooks I've worked with, uh, as all industries are. We're kind of like this um, really small community that you think that is really big, because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of restaurants across the US. But there's not many cities in the US that I don't know a cook or a chef, because they've we've all kind of gone around. We've It's the beauty to cooking. It's, I can go anywhere and cook somewhere and learn something and a lot of cooks do that. Um, my perspective on LA 
Um, and that, I think, which isn't quite West Coast, meaning like it's a little different from Portland to L.A. and then going down to San Diego. Um, but very specifically on L.A., uh, I, I feel like it was a, a type of hospitality where um, the host isn't as important as the other guests. Um, not even on an equal playing field, but um, a lot of places were a place where, you, where you'd go more to be seen um, and to eat and drink the things that were popular to eat and drink. I think LA is changing though since I've been. Um, the Midwest, I even feel like Chicago, even though it has a Midwest personality, uh, there's still a lot of uh, East Coast uh, drive behind it because uh, New York, Boston, those sort of places, uh, you walk into the kitchens, they're really small. Um, at Longman and Eagle, the area that I prepped, I couldn't even stand up. I'm six foot tall. So I actually like kind of like, I developed a stance. It was kind of like my, I didn't bend my knees. I just sort of spread my feet out. And then all the cooks around me also did that because if you were above like 5'10", you'd probably hit your head on a pipe downstairs. Uh, a couple of people actually knocked themselves out in rush. Uh, but yeah, I feel like the, the East Coast is a little bit more, more driven, a little bit more competitive. Uh, the Midwest tends to be a little bit more, um, and very specifically Detroit, uh, tends to be more community driven. Um, you can definitely see that uh, I had friends that opened up Grey Ghost. You guys talked to John. Yep, John was in a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. and he, he called me up like a couple, maybe a week ago now. Um, and he just had questions for me of like purveyors who to ask. And in general chef culture, you don't give away your secrets. But in Detroit, it's like, oh, where do you find some odd thing that you normally can't find, such as call fat or tonka beans or... Uh, just some culinary oddity that you don't normally see, and it's hard to find. You won't find it in a grocery store. Um, where can I get this? Sure. And you share those things. Um, we share each other's kitchens. Uh, opening up Standby, I had Chef Joe, who is part of Grey Ghost, working at Standby. I had Kate Williams in my kitchen. I had Brian Wong from Peterborough in my kitchen. Um, and they were all technically working like an, at an hourly wage for me. Uh, and most chefs wouldn't allow other chefs to just do that so freely. Um, we had uh, <clears throat> Chef James Regato in from Mabel Gray um, a couple weeks ago. And, uh, you know, he does a lot of stuff at Mabel Gray where he brings in his favorite chefs. He's like, I like this person's restaurant. Like, I'm going to have them come in and guest chef for a couple days. And you don't hear about that too often outside of Detroit. I feel like that's fairly unique to this type of community atmosphere. It does happen, obviously, but it's a lot more official in other places where something like Next in Chicago brings in a, a guest chef for you know a three-month rotation, whereas this is maybe one night, you go cook at Mabel Grave for a few hours, and it's kind of low, not really heavily publicized. It's more just, hey, let's, let's create a community in, in this kind of Detroit ecosystem, have a little fun with it, more than being something a little more rigid and, and official. Yeah, and I think of all things that Detroit has going for it. Um, I did my first pop-up here in 2009. Um, it's called The Breakfast Club. It started at midnight uh, in Fresh Park, Detroit. And uh, it ended at 5 a.m. Like I had Andy Holiday from Selden sure. as like sort of my stand-in sous chef. Not that he was my sous chef, but I made all this food and then he was helping me plate everything. We had 400 people walk in the door uh, starting at midnight. And it was just this thing that had been bubbling. And I feel like if anything Detroit has is like it's starting this like birthplace of this cooperative nature uh, in the culinary industry. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons for that. But I think that that's one of the most beautiful things that's always drawn me back to Detroit. Um, I mean, I've left and come back at least half a dozen times now. And every time I actually I grew up with James Rigato. So we both went to whole high school. We're in the same art class, so um, small world. 
you may want to check out the talk he did with us. He wasn't very kind to the city of Howell, so we had to put a little disclaimer on there. So, uh, he didn't mention you in particular, but Howell in general. He said he was happy to get away from Howell and spend more time traveling as well. So check it out next time you get a chance. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you too, and then if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to, to raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone. Um, we ask this question of all of our chefs, and we've gotten a lot of, I guess, semi-mixed responses, uh, but all very similar. So obviously you're here at Google. We talk about expectations of hosts and chefs at restaurants. Um, and then you play kind of the technology layer on top of that, right? So you've got things these days like Yelp, right, um, where the technology of Yelp and the immediacy of information and feedback has really changed expectations from both the host perspective in terms of how they have to host somebody who can put a bad review out literally in real time while they're, you know, if they're, if their 10 sandwiches aren't cut in half in the right way um, versus guests who now have uh, higher expectations because of what they've read from other, um, other folks who have been patrons to the restaurant and things like that. How do you view kind of the merge uh, of technology and this kind of host um, guest ecosystem that you've been chatting about? I think there's uh, a lot to be said about the immediacy of being able to review and um, criticize. Um, I usually try and spend a decent amount of time in the dining room um, just talking to guests and seeing how they are because I think that's one of those things that's important. Um, you, you do need to keep that door open to say like, hey, I don't like this or hey, this isn't what I expected. Um, because our, my job and our job in the hospitality industry is like figuring out what you want as best as we can, but we have moments to figure that out. Um, and then to do it in such a way that you don't notice it. Because my thought of hospitality oftentimes is kind of magical. You walk into a restaurant, you get your piece of paper that's set, set before you. Uh, if you go to Moto, which isn't open anymore, you could have actually eaten it as well. Um, <laughs> but then you, you just point to something on the menu and you say, I want that. And magically, it comes out. Hopefully the way you expect, or better. Um, so I'd actually spend time with people. Uh, I think that's something that we're lacking. And I think, once again, in the reverse, um, people aren't open to actually saying right then and there, saying like, hey, actually, this drink is too bitter. I was like, oh, well, you chose a Vucre. It's kind of a bitter drink. Or, you know, you don't like Campari, probably don't get a Negroni. Um, and that discussion needs to actually be happening, you know, just like any good relationship, whether it's with your mom and dad, your siblings, or a significant other, you need to be talking. Um, and I think Yelp kind of masks that more or less. It, it's a, the ability to kind of hide behind something without actually engaging in a real conversation. Um, that being said, I've, I've read Yelp reviews on the food I've done, the places I've worked, and I've been very sympathetic to them as well. Or, or maybe a better term would be empathetic. Because knowing that there are times where we fail, um, and I feel bad that we fail as a general community, um, and that's totally, that's your right to do that. Sure. Um, if you sit down at, I know I did this once at a California pizza kitchen. Uh, <laughs> I sat down and it became almost a game to me to see how long it was going to be before someone actually acknowledged me. And it was like, initially it was like, oh, five minutes. I mean, it's kind of long. Seven, ten. Now this is fun. Like... I think I need to get a free meal out of this. Like, it took 22 minutes when I went there. For, and I watched servers and things. And that's not right. You know, there is a thing of like, you can actually be wrong. Um, and you do deserve a voice. Uh, but there should be a discussion too. Yep. So, when I did that at California Pizza Kitchen, I didn't write a Yelp review, but I did mention it to the manager and say, like, hey, this, was, this was, wasn't quite right. I do do this for a living as well, but you should probably watch that. Yeah. You know, I think. Well, I think the consensus has been conversation 
and, and kind of two-way feedback is good, but hiding behind technology and, you know, having the courage to yelp, yelp it out to all of your friends uh, as you're sitting there, but not the courage to say something to the waiter or waitress or to ask to speak with the chef is, is not quite the right way to go about it. So I think we've got a long way to go with that, but I think it certainly provides um, some valuable feedback in some cases is, is kind of consensus we've heard around the block. Um, I think uh, oh, sorry, one other note on that, yeah, sure. appropriate ways to handle those situations. If it doesn't get solved at, at the establishment with you talking to someone or you don't feel comfortable saying it, send an email as in a non-public form. And if they still are ignoring you, Please post a Yelp because uh, I know, like, even on things and and proper criticism, not like I didn't like it. Uh, I had someone actually tell me that they didn't like something, and um, what they had ordered was mushroom based, and they said I don't like it. I'm like, oh, what's wrong? Well, they didn't tell me this till after they left, by the way. So they said I didn't like it. I said. Well, what's wrong? I was like, well, I ate it and it just wasn't good. I don't understand what you mean. Can you can you explain? Like, how do I make this better for you? And they said, I don't like mushrooms. <laughs> and I just kind of was like, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> I mean, that's like I would like the I would like the filet mignon, but I don't like beef. Yeah. Is it all right? Yeah. No, you you're not gonna like it. <laughs> um, so like. There, there needs to be criticism with words and like an explanation of like, this was too salty or this was, you know, certain things that we do mess up on, you know. It's a hard skill to understand how to actually season something with salt properly every time, especially when I have fish coming in from two different oceans that has a different salinity content that, you know, you have to season a halibut different than you season a skate wing, different than you season a local uh, salmon that's farm raised or something like that. Uh, so there's things like that that are really difficult and it's hard for a cook to learn. And you should mention that and be specific about your complaints. I think the proper way to salt is like this, right? Like the salt guy. You're right, there. yeah. <laughs> Just let it roll down your arm and, and fall over the fish. So as long as you do it that way, you usually cover it up well. Yeah. Uh, any questions you guys have from the audience? If not, I've got one more before we wrap things up. I tell all my cooks I like questions. It's usually a good thing in the kitchen, right? Yeah. Let, let me ask you, just as, as we kind of wrap things, um, your thoughts on where Detroit goes next. So Detroit's kind of this cool up-and-coming um, city that's experiencing this really cool renaissance and music and art and, and all of these different things. And food is, is a huge staple of that. You're obviously a part of that. Uh, it's come a long way in the past few years. What do you see kind of being the next one or two big things, or what are the next few years look like for the city of Detroit? to kind of carve out its niche in the, in the national scene? I think Detroit definitely has the ability to do things that other major cities haven't. Um, it has the ability to kind of hold true to its nature. Um, and hopefully with the, the investments and everything that goes into it, uh, that thought of like gentrification and whatnot of, of pushing the city of what it was out. Um, hopefully it, it holds together. I know like my aggravations with other major cities like downtown Chicago um, was that kind of just the only the people that could afford to be downtown ended up being downtown and then downtown wasn't as great. Um, I, th I think and I hope that Detroit has a possibility of doing that of being something uh, more community-based, um, more based on the relationships of all the people that have already created what is good in Detroit. Um, and I, I mean, I definitely see a continuing surge in, you know, residential population and, and everything else that's, that's going to keep driving the city to do more things and be more creative. Um, a lot of people that I've talked to, creatives especially, uh, are coming to Detroit because of those opportunities. And if Detroit is, if the people who are most relevant in the control of Detroit pay attention to that, um, then I think that's going to be the most wonderful changes that you'll see in Detroit in the next five years. 
is the creativity and the push and the drive to make a city that is kind of unlike most cities around. Um, and my only big hope that I haven't seen any real promise of is more uh, public transportation. <laughs> They're working on it, the M1, right? Is that what it's called? The M1? Rail it's a, line? It's a start. Yeah. The Q line. The Q line. Very, very well branded. Well, cool. Well, thank you very much um, for all of your insight. I, I like the idea of community. Uh, it's huge, obviously, in the Midwest, in the Midwest and Detroit. And for a lot of us, nothing uh, promotes community quite like food does. So thank you for the part that you've played in, in all of the restaurants around uh, Detroit. Uh, thank you for coming in. We'll, we'll make sure, based on all of your advice, that we try to strive to be better guests in all of the restaurants we have. I don't think anyone owns a restaurant here, so we can't really host that well. You could host at home, I suppose, but be a good host at home, and we'll all try and be the best guests that we possibly can. So, so thank you once again to Chef Edwards for coming in. A quick round of applause. Thank you.